of the Movies, a look at the stories of science and how they change our culture. I'm Lisa Beth Kovitz. In its second season, the TBS show Miracle Workers has moved from heaven back down to earth with a whole new look at the work of humorist Simon Rich. Season two, Dark Ages, based on the short story Revolution, is quirky and fun and sweet and has all the filth and idiocy that we've come to expect from stories about the Middle Ages. But was it really such a dim-witted time period? Our guest today is author John W. Farrell. His new book, The Clock and the Camshaft, looks at some of the inspired medieval inventions that we're still using today. John, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. In Miracle Workers Dark Ages, it's a running gag that everyone is just really, but really, really dumb. Daniel Radcliffe's Prince Chauncey has got a thing for ducks, and Steve Buscemi's Edward Shitsheveler is startled when his daughter invents woohoo a longer handled shovel to help him with his chores. And it's funny and it's charming. But John, really, were the Middle Ages devoid of common sense? That means you'll kill me, right? Mm -hmm. Just wanted to make sure we're on the same page. Not at all. Um, in fact, in a way, uh, the Middle Ages were all about common sense um, since they didn't have a great deal to work with after the collapse of the Roman Empire. Um, the people of the Middle Ages, uh, especially the early part, which was more commonly described as the Dark Ages. Um, they had to pick up the pieces of a once great civilization and make do. Uh, they were dealing with waves of you know, invasions constantly. I mean, if you were at the lowest level, a peasant farmer, uh, you, you really had to live by your wits. And, and this also meant um, taking what tools were left, and there weren't many, and thinking up new ways to farm just to survive. So I would argue that um, common sense was literally all they had. Okay, so who started these rumors about the Dark Ages? It was those, it was those Renaissance guys, wasn't it? Yes, uh, yes. The Renaissance guys who thought of themselves as much more educated. And of course, uh, on a one-to-one -one basis, they were more educated than people in the Middle Ages. Uh, however, they were sort of um, overlooking the fact that there was no history of the Middle Ages the way we think of it now. There was just this huge gap between them and what they loved looking uh, at in their bookshelves, which were cool translations of... Uh, the Roman poets and the playwrights, and wasn't this awesome rediscovering all this great work of classical antiquity? And you know what the hell happened to those those silly people in between? How could they let this all go? Well, you know that's kind of um, uh, brought out of their own ignorance about what came immediately. I mean, it's interesting to think that even the cathedrals were just kind of rotting away because they didn't appreciate them. Uh, the Renaissance people. It was only later ages where a sense of history uh, began to develop, an actual study of history began to develop that more appreciation of the Middle Ages came about. Um, so yeah, uh, the Renaissance guys basically um, get the blame for that. And, and culturally, we view the Renaissance as a glorious outpouring of advancements, but the Spanish Inquisition dates from 1478 to 1834, and the Roman Inquisition puts Galileo on house arrest from 1632 until his death. And aside from ruining the word Inquisition, do we lose sight of the actual dates in our pop culture versions of the Renaissance versus the medieval age? Oh yes, I think it definitely blurs. I mean, the transition was not abrupt at all. And um, if you go back to some of the older movies uh, that were made uh, and compare them to uh, more historically um, accurate films today, uh, you can see kind of what's left out and what gets blurred. So for example, one of my favorite movies, A Man for All Seasons uh, does this. Um, you've got the villainous Cromwell threatening uh, Thomas More with torture if he doesn't agree to you know, the king's marriage to Queen Anne. And, you know, Thomas is kind of the hero. I will not take the oath. I will not tell you why I will not. I might get it out of you in other ways. In Wolf Hall, though, which is more accurate, we see a more kind of medieval side to this whole period. Uh, and Thomas More himself as chancellor um, uh, had people interrogated brutally who were suspected of heresy. And he sent six of the Protestant reformers in England uh, to be burnt at the stake. So there's, there's quite an overlap. <laughs> But, but we, as a culture, see Renaissance as gloriously flowing and medieval as, oh my gosh, that's practically medieval. Yeah. Many years after Monty Python went in search of the Holy Grail, it was impossible to make dramatic movies about the time period. But now the Dark Ages genre is back with a vengeance from Game of Thrones to Vikings to more medieval video games than we could list. And I'm not going to lie, I have a pink floaty princess costume in my closet, left over from Halloween. So... John, why do you think we humans like this period so much? I think one answer is uh, we find it incredibly sexy. Uh, in an age like ours, 
uh, where people seem to wear less and less clothing in public and in the various media. We love watching people from ages past, whether historical or fantastical, where people had no central heating and they had to dress up heavily and colorfully to stay warm even indoors. And of course, we can't wait for them to take their clothes off. <laughs> In but it is the costume. It is the costume. I knew it was the costume. In reality, um, they really did take their clothes off completely, even when they were having sex, which again, I think is a tribute to the fact that most of the time people were just cold. <laughs> yeah. uh, we look at the people of the Middle Ages um, as much also, I think, as much less inhibited than we are uh, across many spectrums, publicly and privately, uh, about sex, about violence and about religion. Um, Ian McShane's villainous bishop in Pillars of the Earth, um, he's never without his Bible, and he's not an, an anachronistic cynic. As manipulative as he is, um, to the end, he really believes that you know, he's, what he's doing is for the glory of God, and he's quite open about it, and also quite ruthless, um, which leads to another aspect. Um, where I think we're fascinated by the institutionalized and very public uh, cruelty, hangings, beheadings, uh, people humiliated in the stocks, drawings and quarterings. Um, another reason is um, uh, it's the Middle Ages, it's a perfect setting for the lone hero or heroine having to fight against the odds without any of the technological gadgets that we take for granted. Um, so it comes back to um, the people in the Middle Ages thriving by their wits, their common sense, uh, because they didn't have a lot of, of else to exploit. Now, now, your first book was about Lemaitre, Einstein, and the birth of modern cosmology. So what attracted you intellectually to the medieval period? Lemaitre, well, as a priest, he got some pushback and more than a little cold shouldering in his early career, uh, because at the time, the early 20th century, there weren't many Catholic priests working in science and precious few in the area of um, relativistic physics and quantum mechanics. So he repeatedly had to contradict scientists who were not religious and who suggested or accused him of developing his Big Bang theory for religious reasons as a way to prove that God created the universe in a single point in space time. Uh, this was not accurate, but the notion persisted. Um, and unfortunately, it didn't help that uh, the Pope at the time was happy to display his own enthusiasm for the Big Bang, precisely because he thought it seemed so nicely to fit with the biblical view from Genesis. Lemaitre was reportedly quite annoyed by this, and in private, he and the head of the Vatican Observatory told the Pope he wasn't helping the debate. Um, but his career and other aspects of the history of religious origins of science, uh, that's what got me interested in where it all started. Uh, and that led me back to the Middle Ages, uh, to the translation movements, to the creation of the universities, uh, without which it's really hard to imagine how science uh, could have emerged and su succeeded, excuse me, as an autonomous discipline. Well, it's amazing because now we, we have this image of the church and science being opposed, but you're saying in the beginning they were actually together. Yes. Yeah. Married. Yes. I think, I think you could, science evolved out of um, uh, the medieval uh, Christian church, especially its educational institutions. You know, we had Brian Greene on the show a while back, and we asked him who was the greater genius, Albert Einstein or Isaac Newton, and without hesitation, he voted for Newton because Einstein had Newton's shoulders to stand on. Uh, but in the years you're writing about this book, what basic understanding of science and technology were people working with? Well, the short answer is none in the sense of science as we understand it, meaning a written body of knowledge about laws of nature committed to paper and constantly retested and refined. Um, but there did develop among the medieval artisans, the engineers, a very real body of knowledge about the art of uh, mill design, building, um, architecture, handcrafts, tool making, and agriculture. And all of this was passed on orally by experience and on-the-job on the training and apprenticeship. Um, you might recall the wonderful novella by Tolkien, Smith of Wooden Major. Now, it's about an apprentice to a town cook, but it's an example, a modest one, of um, how medieval apprentices were trained, you know, throughout their life. Um, we do have from the later Middle Ages, um, architects and engineers beginning to commit their ideas and their designs to paper. Uh, Villard de Honnecourt uh, is one I discuss in my book. Um, one of his sketchbooks has survived from the 13th century. And one of his most intriguing uh, drawings is for a mechanical saw powered by a vertical water mill. It occurs to me that, that the need uh, to, ha to, to, have, to come up with these ideas, to come up with these inventions is related to personal need. There was, no, there was no one that you owned that was going to do the labor for free. So you had the lack of slavery 
advanced the society. I think that's, that's definitely definitely true. Now you did have serfdom, you know, in the times of feudal yes. times. So uh, people were um, forced to farm on particular parts of land because they owned whoever the landlord was. So you could say that slavery kind of, you know, mutated into something almost as evil, but not quite as evil. But I think generally that's correct. Um, as slavery disappeared, you know, people had to figure out things for themselves. The book is called The Clock and the Camshaft. So let's start with the clock and let's break it into two parts. Why is the clock so technologically amazing? And how did that change? How did that thing that we take for granted change the world? I think it's amazing because it was really created by intuition. Um, it was created by craftsmen who had no access to mathematics, you know, principles of physics, anything. Nobody knew what the law of inertia was. And yet inertia was like a key component of basically, basically creating uh, a clock that was worked by the power of gravity. And of course, that, nobody knew what the law of gravity was. Um, they just knew that it worked. You know, if you stepped off the top of a building, you, you'd die because the law of gravity would kill you. Um, so they basically came together and pretty much the consensus is that this was a team of craftsmen, blacksmiths and probably millwrights, who were creating a, a geared mechanism that would, uh, at a certain time of night, ring the church bells for the monastery so that the monks could get up and know when they were supposed to go do their prayers. Um, in fact, the word clock comes from the old word for bell uh, in English. Um, so it was a very um, kind of hair splitting experiment. It must have taken a huge amount of trial and error to figure out you know, how to use weight to turn the clock, but also how to use inertia to keep it from just running off the rails and hitting the floor. Uh, so that must have required a very delicate um, experimental uh, time of experimenting with, with weight size, experimenting with gear size, until you got something that literally tick tock, tick tock, tick tock, is powering a clock and can do it for like 12 hours, 24 hours or longer before someone has to pull the weights up and let it keep going. Uh, so this beats, definitely beats um, having to rely on a candle to burning down and tell you what time of night it is. And it definitely beats, you know, water clocks, you know, filling a huge basin with water and then sinking another thing in it to hopefully try to figure out, you know, how to do time that way. Um, but the mechanization of time in this way, uh, to your second question, it allowed, suddenly, uh, Europe could um, standardize time. Once you had a machine that could tell time, then the guys in the next town could do it too, and the guys in the next town, and pretty soon everybody in the country. And I think it was France that first standardized a uniform time based on their clocks. It's a giant feat of engineering to do that without computers, with somewhat limited mathematics. This is, yeah. this yeah. is you're right. Okay, you're right. It's a big deal. <laughs> <laughs> right, and it, it, it must have taken, um, who knows how long in terms of trial and error. I mean, the poor blacksmith must have been making different size weights. They were trying those out against, you know, the gear wheel, what worked, what didn't. Um, right, and it's trial and error and not math. Yes, exactly. Um, and again, we're, I think in our age, we're so used to always having an individual responsible for some great invention or some great discovery. Uh, and nobody knows who these people were, they're long gone, um, which in a way is sad. Uh, but again, in another way, it's a tribute to how they collectively came together to work and achieve something that is, uh, is breathtaking to this day. Well, I think we like the story of individual achievement, but often the reality is not individual, individual achievements. It's, it's often a build on, on other people's uh, work. But so how did the clock change the world? At first, it was uh, a kind of luxury or status symbol for bishops uh, showing off their machines in the towers, uh, the churches and the cathedrals. Um, uh, but as the craftsmen perfected the devices, they made them more affordable uh, so that towns could have their own clocks, you know, in the town center. Uh, and eventually even families could have their own. I mean, I grew up with a classic grandfather clock. It's broken. It doesn't work anymore. But every four or five days when I was a kid, I had to go downstairs and, you know, haul the weights back up, you know, because they would eventually tick tock right to the bottom and hit the floor. Um, uh, but to this question, the mechanization of timekeeping as it began in the Middle Ages, it began to have, uh, I think, a powerful influence on society in terms of organizing the economy and the culture. It also had a huge effect on the study of science because of what became science, because once you could accurately measure time right down to the second, um, it became possible to more rigorously define all motion in mathematics. And, and so to Brian Greene's uh, excellent point, if Einstein 
stood on the shoulders, shoulders of Newton. I think Newton stood on the shoulders of all these forgotten craftsmen who came before him and invented the clock. Um, now there was a cultural downside to this as well, uh, which we I think all, we're living it. I think we're living it right this moment. We're yeah. living the cultural downside. <laughs> yeah, we're slaves to the clock. <laughs> um, and, uh, and I mentioned this in the book, even by Shakespeare's time, uh, his Richard II, as you recall, laments, I wasted time and now doth time waste me, for now hath time made me his numbering clock. Uh, so it didn't take long for people to start worrying about Mm. what a life of time <laughs> was turning yeah. into. And what about the camshaft? What is a camshaft and, and how, did it, did, uh, how, did, how does it change the world? Well, the key advantage of the camshaft, um, it's basically an axle that has what almost look like fins. Um, and it allowed craftsmen to exploit water and wind power for a much wider range of uh, innovation and production. So you have a mill wheel with just a bare axle. It can power a millstone, you know, for grinding grain, or a stone for sharpening tools. But once you add cams or these fins to the axle, you in effect can now utilize that same axis, horizontal axis, um, to power trip hammers, like a whole series of trip hammers. And these can be used to crush stone, uh, pound cloth, um, pulp rags for paper, drive a forge bellows for a blacksmith, um, or a mechanical saw for woodworkers and carpenters. So productivity basically increased by leaps and bounds once this was adopted. So the clock and the camshaft really represent time and power yes. or energy. And those are still the same things that are driving us today. It really is very interesting how things don't change. Yes. Um, yeah. We still need to grind grain for our bread. Yeah. yeah. And we still need more power and, and time. Yes. And it's interesting too that I think, especially with climate change and uh, all the shortcomings and the problems with fossil fuels, we are now finding ourselves, our science, looking back to more natural means of power uh, yeah. to get us away from uh, dependence on that. In The Miracle Worker's Dark Ages, Maggie, played by Lolly Adafope, embarks on a career as a Christian nun and, as part of her vows, she's often seen slamming a piece of wood into her own forehead. Do you ever feel like we're living during a particularly bad period in history? <laughs> In our stories of the medieval world, the role of the church in securing scientific gains is often cast as, let's say, unhelpful at best. But as in the Citadel in Game of Thrones, the church had the books. And, and as in Ken Follett's Pillars of the Earth, the church wanted architecturally complex cathedrals complete with vaulted ceilings. So, John, where does the medieval church fall in aiding or stunting technology? I don't think you can say it stunted it. Uh, it definitely was on the side of aiding. Um, in terms of fostering the adoption of technology, the great mills, the monasteries were key supporters of innovation and building, um, which, you know, of course, culminated in the great cathedrals. Um, after the fall of the Roman Empire, uh, cities and towns were deserted. The monasteries really became not only the centers that preserved um, what written learning they could, um, they were also huge adopters of mills and served as protectors uh, to all the nearby villages and settlements. Um, if there's anything negative, you could say uh, over the centuries, um, their centralized power of production inspired some greed uh, among some of the establishments. And, and they used their authority with the feudal lords uh, to ban local and private ownership of the, even the simplest mills so that the poorest folk were forced often to bring their grain to the monasteries and pay a fee for a service that they would have much preferred to do at home with their own little hand mills. Uh, this result, uh, aroused um, a great deal of resentment and hostility throughout the Middle Ages. Um, there were rebellions and some were crushed. Uh, so there was a tale to be told there. Um, but in terms of promoting technology, I really think you have to give the church an A. Uh, the church should also get, I think, uh, a lot of credit uh, for two um, social inventions, uh, meaning the university as an autonomous um, corporate entity devoted to higher learning and open to all, uh, and then the fostering of the guilds, which helped craftsmen uh, protect themselves and their industries 
Uh, and these both had um, a huge impact for the later uh, Renaissance. In Ken Follett's Pillars of the Earth, it's, it's all about the machinations, political and scientific, behind building a great cathedral. But in the story, we also see the beginnings of financial bureaucracies. Aliana, played by Haley Atwell in the series, becomes a wool merchant. And also that's where came in the, you see her a lot with the color. She, she, she does well because she colors her, her wool so interestingly. But she also manipulates money in a way that is common now, but remarkable for the time. And so, John, do, do corporations have their roots in, in the medieval church? Yes, yes, absolutely. It basically grows out of a, a kind of a tension and fight between the popes uh, and the kings. Um, the, king, the popes felt that the kings had too much authority in deciding, you know, what, one, who gets to be a bishop, who gets to be pope. So they needed to create a body of law, which they did, that they could rely on to kind of push back and um, kind of create their own autonomy. Um, and this was for their own reason. The popes weren't thinking that, hey, this will have all sorts of great side effects for the rest of society. But that's exactly what happened. You know, this body of corporate law allowed, you know, trade skills um, to uh, become more independent and autonomous. It allowed the cathedral schools to basically become universities, literally to write their own charters and say, hey, back off. We run this institution. And, and even if the local bishop is upset at what we're teaching, we're going to teach it anyway. Um, so that's basically where the whole corporate identity uh, came from. Right. We lose sight of what, how, how important bureaucracies are for change and growth and the ability for any individual or family to advance. I think that we, bureaucracy gets a bad name uh, because it's wrapped up with this, con with this cultural concept of red tape, uh, where it really is actually a very useful thing. Yes. In the Middle Ages, bureaucracy was good. <laughs> <laughs> So, John, do these technological changes drive changes in society, or is it the demands of society that drive technological change? I think it's mostly the latter. <clears throat> uh, people need something, so they figure out a way to make it. Um, it's hard to believe now, of course, because we feel like we're slaves to like, oh, the next iPhone just came up. We all have to go get it, <laughs> that kind of thing. Uh, but in those days, I think people saw a need, and they figured out one way or another how to make it happen. Um, so the earliest examples, um, the heavy plow, the breast harness for horses, uh, three field crop rotation. These, I think all of all that of the need of people in Northern Europe where the climate wasn't so friendly to figure out the best way to maximize their crops. I think that we can all really understand innately uh, the need uh, for technology to help us solve problems. But what we, I think what you really brought up that was so interesting when we were talking about corporations is the need for power also brings about technological changes, both physical power in terms of the camshaft and structural power in terms of the corporation. Yes, and I think as we move on into the Renaissance, um, the other kind of power, uh, monetary power, financial power, is what drove um, you know, the merchants uh, into uh, their voyages of discovery, which of course sent Europe across the ocean to America and and there's a whole new era of exploration, um, which, of course, is, uh, was about both kinds of power, financial power, but then political power, as um, the various countries of Europe got invested in colonizing. Uh, and, of course, you know, there's lots of good and bad sides to that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, if you had to pick the technological change that made the greatest impact, what would it be? I think you could argue the most consequential was the invention of the university and the corporate guilds. Um, the idea of corporate autonomy began with the church, um, but it just had so many repercussions down to, right down to the present. Um, I think by reestablishing canon law, the church and also inspired the cathedral schools to write their own corporate charters. And you have universities, which are really the safe space where the scholars who would eventually lead us to the scientific revolution could work on anything. Uh, unprotected uh, from, you know, harassment. I mean, of course, Galileo, we all know about what happened to Galileo. Um, but I think even he uh, wouldn't have had uh, the freedom to do what he did, to experiment with telescopes, to think about the laws of motion, to kind of push back at the old astronomical system. Um, if there hadn't been that, uh, that kind of foundation of university education that allowed that kind of free thinking. Uh, so I would put that as probably uh, the most consequential uh, invention 
it's it's a close tie with others, but um, that would be my vote. I thought you were going to say paper. I <laughs> that's the close tie because of, <laughs> without without cheap paper, uh, you would have had more literacy um, even in the Renaissance. But it would have been only amongst uh, the classes of people who could afford, um, you know, uh, very costly books. Um, with cheap paper, you have literacy spreading across all classes. And that had a huge impact, of course, for the spread of the Protestant Reformation. And that changed everything. So that's a close second. Interesting. So speaking of books, we are out of time. And the book is The Clock in the Camshaft and Other Medieval Inventions We Still Can't Live Without. John W. Farrell, thank you so much for spending time with us. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure. <laughs>